Hi all, today we are going to discuss essentials of analog indicating instruments. So first let us start with the classification of the analog instruments. So broadly the analog instruments can be classified into two categories. First one is called as the absolute instrument and the second type is the secondary instrument. The first one is name itself is telling the absolute instruments. So this gives the value of the electrical quantity to be measured in terms of constants of the deflection. That means the reading will not be direct value. The reading will be in terms of the constant and using those constants values we have to calculate the what is the magnitude of the electrical quantity. But the advantage of this instrument is no comparison with other instruments is required and also the instruments are more accurate when compared to the secondary type of instruments. So that's why these are mainly used only in the standard laboratories because it does not give the direct deflection. It will give some different parameters so we have to calculate from them. So let us take one example to understand this. So I am taking the tangent galvanometer. So tangent galvanometer gives the value of the current in terms of tangent of deflection produced. That means it will be in the form of tan theta. Theta is the deflection. It will be in terms of tan theta, the radius r and number of turns n of the galvanometer and the horizontal component of the earth field. Or we can tell that the current is nothing but h into r, r is the radius divided by 2 pi n into tan theta. So this meter will indicate the value of the tan theta, r, n and h because h is constant, r is constant, n is constant. The reading is produced in terms of the tan theta or theta. So from that we have to calculate this value by substituting in the formula. So now coming to the secondary instrument. So in the case of secondary instrument, the quantity to be measured is obtained in terms of deflection of the pointer. So secondary instrument will be like that. So directly pointer will deflect and show the value. So wherever pointer is indicated directly, the value will be mentioned there. Let us take for example. So in this case, you can see here the reading is mentioned 400 or it is also mentioned as a 200, 600 because it is a double range type of micro ammeter. So directly the value of the current in amperes is mentioned here directly. That is called as the secondary instrument. So the quantity to be measured is obtained in terms of deflection of the pointer. So how this is done? This is done by calibrating the instrument. So the calibration is done by comparison either with an absolute instrument or standard instrument which is already calibrated. So these are used in all general purpose applications except in standard laboratories where very high accuracy is required. So most of our frequently used applications will use only secondary instrument. So we are confining our discussion to secondary instruments only. So now coming to the secondary instruments, different type of secondary instrument can be classified as indicating instruments integrating instruments and recording instruments. So let us see one by one. The first one is the indicating instrument. The indicating instruments that directly indicate the value of the electrical quantity being measured at the instant of its measurement. So example will be ammeter, voltmeter and wattmeter. It will directly show the value of the measurement. What is the value at the instant we are measuring. Then the second type of instrument is integrating instrument. The name itself is telling that it will do the integration of any quantity. Like for example, I want to measure like there is a watt meter if you are doing the integration of power so integration of power will become energy so similarly integration of current that is called as ampere hour meter so they measure the total quantity of electricity that is either in ampere hour or energy in watt hour in a given time so example let us assume in my system 60 watts of power is connected or load is connected for one hour and 100 watt load is connected for two hour. So your energy meter will indicate the total energy. Generally energy meter is indicates in kilowatt hour. So kilowatts means 1000 watts is one kilowatt. So in terms of hours. So you have to do the integration this dt or the time will be in hours. So 60 watts is for one hour. So I am multiplying with one. Now 100 watts is for two hours. I am multiplying with two. I am dividing by 1000 to get it terms of kilowatt. So that's why it will be 0 0.26 kilowatt hour. So this energy meter, what it will show, it will show 0 0.26 kilowatt hour. It will go on integrating the value, getting it. So these are used in our household applications to know how many units of power is consumed. Then the third type is called as a recording instruments. So recording instrument is similar to that of the indicating instrument only, but here along with the indication, the indicated value is recorded. Like for example, if you see here, this is my pointer, this pointer, can move in this manner. This pointer can move in this 
in this manner sorry the pointer can move like this the pointer will move in this manner so this is the motion of the pointer this is the motion of the disc so this is the motion of the disc the disc will rotate like this and this pointer will oscillate depending on the magnitude of the quantity so that quantity is recorded so this gives a continuous record of the quantity being measured over a specific period the variation of the quantity is recorded by a pen system resting lightly on a drum moving perpendicular to the movement of the pen so this is the movement of the pen so this i am writing so this is movement of pen and the disc is direction of rotation of the disc will be perpendicular to the movement of the pen so that is recorded so the example is these are used in recording voltmeters are used in generating stations so to record the voltage of supply mains during the day this is one of such applications so then essentials of indicating instruments because even if you are taking the integrating instruments also it is nothing but indicating instrument where the integration is done for the quantity over the time Similarly, I told the recording instrument also it has the basic thing is indicating instrument only. So anywhere the quantity to be measured should be shown and that value if it is integrated it is called integrated. If it is recorded it is called as a recording instrument. So that's why let us see essentials of indicating instruments. So three types of tasks are required for satisfactory operation of the indicating instrument. So let us assume I want to measure the current. If you give the current to the uh, instrument so in order to produce a deflection or show the magnitude of the current three tasks are required so first task will be called as a deflecting or also called as the operating task and the second task is controlling or which is also called as the restoring task so the combination of these two tasks will bring your pointer to the rest at a position where the deflecting task will be equal to controlling torque and then another type of torque is also required that is a damping torque so this damping torque ensures that the pointer will come to the rest at the final position without any oscillation so that the quick measurement is possible we can take the reading at a quicker and accurate manner so let us see each one of these torque in detail first i am starting with the deflecting torque so deflecting torque causes the moving system to move from the zero position to indicate the value of the electrical quantity being measured. So depending on which type of technique is used for producing the deflecting torque or the torque required for moving the pointer, so different effects are there. If you are using the magnetic effect, so this magnetic effect is used in moving iron type of instruments. This can be used both for DC as well as AC and used in ammeters and voltmeters. Similarly, we can use the electrodynamic effect. Electrodynamic effect is used in permanent magnet moving coil instruments, which are used only for DC and ammeters and voltmeters. And it is also used in dynamometer type of instruments, so which can be used both for DC as well as AC and can be used for ammeters, voltmeters or watt meters then another type of effect is electromagnetic induction effect so electromagnetic induction effect is used in induction type instruments so induction type instruments can work only for the case of ac these are used for ammeter voltmeter watt meter and energy meters then there is a thermal effect so these are used in hot wire instruments so this can be used for both dc and ac and used for manufacturing ammeters and voltmeters. Similarly, electrostatic effect can be used for both DC as well as AC for measurement of the voltage. Similarly, chemical effect is used for electrolytic meters, which is used for DC only. And this is mainly used in ampere hour meters for measuring how much amount of power is stored or energy is stored in a battery. So for that purpose, we go for this electrolytic meter is used getting it so detailed analysis of each of these meters what is the construction how they are working that will be discussed in detail in the coming lectures so that's why i am proceeding further so if deflecting torque is acting alone then like for example this is my pointer so inside here there will be a coil so this is my pmmc type of instrument permanent magnet moving coil there will be permanent magnet in the outside inside there will be a coil when the current is passing through the coil the torque will be produced getting it so when the deflecting torque or the torque is produced it will push the pointer in this direction so when the pointer is pushed what happens irrespective of how much amount of torque is there the pointer will directly go to the final position because there is no opposing force for this pointer so same thing is mentioned here if deflecting torque is acting alone the pointer will continue to move to the maximum deflection position irrespective of magnitude of input quantity to be measured so this necessitate to provide some form of controlling or opposing torque so that the movement of the pointer or final 
point where the pointer will stop. So that will depend on the magnitude of the quantity that is passing through this deflecting coil. So for that, we use the controlling torque. So for producing torque, controlling torque, for example, I can use a spring. You can see here small helical spring is there. So this spring, what it will do, when the pointer is in zero position, the spring force will be nearly zero. But when the pointer start moving, this whatever the spring is there, it will go on tightening. So it will be tightened. So it will try to exert an opposing force. So the amount of force exerted by the spring depend on how much will be the movement of this pointer. So always this spring will try to oppose the movement of the pointer. As the pointer is moving away, it will be tightened more. So more torque will be exerted. Or we can tell that this controlling torque will go on increasing as the pointer is changing its position from zero to final position. So same thing I am summarizing here. The controlling torque must oppose the deflecting torque and should increase with the deflection of the pointer. So when the pointer deflection of the pointer is changing, automatically that value should goes on increasing. And because the controlling torque is opposing the deflecting torque, so pointer will come to the rest at a position when controlling torque is equal to deflecting torque. So controlling torque perform basically two functions. First one is the produce a torque equal and opposite to the deflecting torque so that the final position of the pointer on the scale will be according to the magnitude of the input quantity under measurement. This is first purpose. And second purpose, let us assume I have measured the current and now the switch is open circuited. That means the power is turned off. When the power is turned off, because let us assume the pointer is indicating at this position, when the power is turned off, the pointer should come back to zero position. So it serves that purpose also. So to second purpose I have mentioned here, to bring the moving system back to zero position when the deflecting torque is removed. That is the second application. So this controlling torque can be obtained either by using the spring control or gravity control. So practically spring control is used in practice for most of the applications. Gravity control is used only in the laboratory type of instrument where the instrument is always kept in the vertical position and where you want your cost should be minimum and you know that your instrument will not be moved from the vertical position. So the detailed analysis of the spring control and gravity control or how the controlling torque is produced with the numericals will be discussed in the next class. So that's why I am proceeding for that. So then going to the damping torque. So the damping torque, let us assume the instrument, I want that my final position of this instrument is here. So I want this is my final position. This is my final position. So now what happens? This instrument will move from here and gradually move to this position. Agree with me? So when the instrument is moving, because we know that our moving system will have some weight. So whenever there is a weight, it will have some movement of inertia. So because of the inertia, once the pointer reaches up to here, it will not stop at this position. It will move ahead. That means the pointer will not stop at that position. It will move up to the new position up to this position. So at this position, now what happens? The controlling torque, because it is moved ahead, so controlling torque is greater than the deflecting torque. So it will move ahead due to inertia, it will come to rest. So at this position, as the controlling torque is greater than the deflecting torque, so it will start moving back. So it will move back. Again, when it reaches this position, it will not stop. Again, due to the inertia or the kinetic energy, so it will not go same distance like before. So it will come here. So it will reach this position. So again, what will happen? Again, it will move and again, it will come back again. It will move like that. The oscillation will continue. And finally, when this kinetic energy becomes zero, it will stabilize at a point or the moment of the pointer I can represent like this. So initially, when the pointer is moving, it will go on moving the pointer. This is my final position where it should stop, but it will not stop due to moment of inertia. It will swing ahead. That means it will go for a higher value of the reading. This is my deflection or the reading. So then it will stop there. And as the controlling torque is greater than the deflecting torque, it will start moving in the opposite direction. Again, it will not stop here because again, due to inertia, it will proceed further. Again here, now what happens? So at this point, the deflecting torque is greater than the controlling torque. So again, it will swing back. So again, this process will continue for some time. Finally, this will damp out 
and finally it will stabilize. This is called as under damped system. So if your system is having this type, so whenever you are connecting your meter to measure some current, it will go on oscillating in the final position before coming to rest. So you cannot take the reading dynamically. So particularly in the applications where your power is continuously fluctuating or value is continuously fluctuating, you want to note down the reading at a faster rate, you cannot do it. So what is the solution for that? I want that when the pointer is moving, it should reach the final position and it should stop there. So in order to provide that one, I have to provide some type of call that is called as the damping torque. So let us proceed further with the theory, then we will proceed further. So due to inertia of the moving system, the pointer will isolate around its final deflecting position before coming to rest. So this makes difficult to obtain the quick and accurate readings. So damping torque should act only when the pointer is in motion and always opposes the motion. So whenever the motion is there in the pointer, it should oppose it. And when the pointer is not moving, that means in the final study position, I want my damping torque should be zero. Let us assume I have provided some damping in such a way that that pointer will not go ahead of the final position. So that I can represent like this. This is my case. You can see here the pointer is gradually rising it will reach the final position. But if it is taking so much time, that is called as over damped. So this is called as the over damped system. There is no oscillation, but that pointer will go to the final point very slowly. Like for example, if you are using the bike, you can observe where the petrol indicating instrument will be there or petrol indicating meter will be there. When you keep the key and turn on your bike, it will take some time to show the actual value of the fuel in your tank analog instrument particularly, they are over damped because whenever you are driving your car or bike, because there will be a jerk, so your oil will go on moving inside. So the oscillation or the reading of the instrument should not change frequently. That's why they are generally provided with over damped case. So that's why it is over damping. But I want my reading should come as early as possible. And at the same time, my oscillation should be zero. So as you are going on decreasing the value of the damping torque, a point will reach where it will exactly reach the final value without any oscillation. So if you are decreasing below this, oscillations will be there. Above this, there will be no oscillation. So this point is called as critically damped or deadbeat. This is called as critically damped or deadbeat. Ideally, I want my damping torque should be critically damped or deadbeat, but practically it may be little bit over damped or under damped because exact designing will be very difficult task. So this damping torque can be provided either by using air friction damping or fluid friction damping or eddy current damping. So let us see each one of them. So first I am starting with the air friction damping. Air friction damping can be provided using two techniques. So first technique is this is my pointer and this is my spindle. So whenever your pointer is moving like this, moving in this position, so this spindle is attached to a piston. So that means when this is moved like this, so this will also move like this, agree with me? So because when this is rotated in this manner, so this will also rotate. So when this is rotated, this will move upwards and downwards. So now when the piston is moving in an air chamber, so the piston is designed in such a way, it is made up of aluminum so that the weight of the moving parts will be minimum. It is inside an air chamber, so which is closed in one side, this side it is open. So when the piston, let us assume when the piston is moving inwards, when the piston is moved inside, because the air inside the chamber, the pressure will increase. So when the pressure will increase, it will try to oppose the movement. So similarly, when the piston is pulled outside, that means when the pointer is moving in another direction, when the piston is pulled out, so vacuum is created here. When the piston is pulled out, here the pressure is decreased. So when the pressure is decreased, this side the pressure is increased, again that will oppose the motion of the piston. That means whenever the piston is moving inward or outward, it will oppose it. And under stationary condition, there is no effect of this piston getting it and small air gap will be provided so that whatever the vacuum is there, other things are there under study condition that can easily escape from here. So, but the disadvantage of this type of piston is we have to provide the piston in such a way that the gap between these two cylinder and the piston should be very less. And in practice, whenever you are not handling your instrument properly, when you move your instrument or other thing, this will be so much delicate that means piston may damage. That means the piston may come and touch this air chamber. And whenever your instrument is moving, this will erode with this one and that will create the problem. So that's why this air friction, this type of system is not used in practice. In practice, we go for another type of system in which there will be a vein. So this is my spindle. So this is my spindle. You can see this is vertical. This is the side view. So from here, one rod will be there 
through this one vein will be connected. So the same thing I have mentioned the top view here, this is the vein. So this vein is kept in a sector shaped air chamber, closed air chamber. So whenever the pointer is moving, this vein will move in the closed air chamber. So in this case, as it is moving in the air chamber, it will create the required amount of the damping torque. And here the advantage is, even if there is some gap between this vein and this chamber, it is not going to affect your damping torque so much. And the problem of the previous case is solved. So practically, this vein type is used in practice if you are going for air friction damping. So same thing, I am just summarizing the theory what I have written here. So in the first case, light aluminum piston is attached to the moving system and moves in an air chamber closed at one end. Piston can be either rectangular or circular. The clearance between the piston and sides of the chamber must be as small and uniform. When the piston is moved into the chamber, pressure is increased and hence opposes the motion. When the piston is moved out, vacuum is created and opposes the motion. This is the thing that is happens. So coming to the vein type, so vein is mounted on a spindle of moving system and moves inside a closed sector shaped box. So there will be a closed sector shaped box will be there. And this sector shaped box is either made up of bakelite or die casting or cast iron. So above that one lid will be kept and it will be tightened using this screws. So inside that this chamber will be there. Getting it, that provides the required damping. So next going to the fluid friction damping. So this is similar to that of air friction damping. So instead of air, because air is not having the sufficient damping torque cannot be produced. So instead of air, we go for the oil. Because the advantage of the oil is oil will have the viscosity. Because of viscosity, it will have the more damping torque because it will have more opposing torque when compared to air. So that's why oil is air is replaced by the oil in this case. So in this case, a light vein is attached to the spindle of the moving system and this vein is dipped in the oil, completely submerged in the oil. So more than one vein also can be used in practice. So when the moving system is moved, the vein moves inside the oil. So because of viscosity of the oil, that movement is opposed. So we provide more damping torque is produced. But fluid friction damping is not suitable for portable instrument because whenever you are providing this oil damping, so automatically this moving system should be kept in this one. So automatically this size of the instrument increases because you have to provide the oil tank. So automatically the instrument cannot be portable. The size of the instrument increases. And second disadvantage is there is a chance that your oil can leak from the chamber and spoil your instrument. That means instrument should be used in fixed position. It cannot be tilted or moved in whatever manner you want. We cannot handle rough and tough. That is a disadvantage of oil damping. But oil damping is used in practice for the case of electrostatic voltmeters. In the case of electrostatic voltmeters, what will be there? We are going to see that electrostatic voltmeters, two veins will be there. That means it will be like a capacitor. So two plates will move away from each other. So when the plates are moving, when they are oscillating, it should stop it. So in this case, the spindle will be like this. So, and there will be a disc. Instead of vein, there will be a disc dipped inside the oil and the spindle can move in this manner. So whenever the spindle is moving like this, we should provide the damping torque. When the disc is moving inside this oil, it provides a required damping torque. So same thing I have mentioned here for electrostatic instruments where movement is suspended rather than pivoted. That means it is suspended like this and it can move only in the vertical position. In that case, this is used in practice. Other cases, it is not used in practice. In practice, we go for either air friction damping or eddy current damping. Wherever eddy current damping is possible, we prefer the eddy current damping only. It has the highest damping torque. So if it is not possible, then we go for the oil, the air friction damping. Oil is used only for few applications only. So now coming to eddy current damping, eddy current damping, again, two types are there. One is the metal former type and second one is the metal disc type. So first I am starting with the metal disc type. This is used in your energy meter or your watt meter induction type meters. So what will be there here? There will be aluminum disc. So this aluminum disc, you can see this is my spindle and this is my pointer. So whenever it is moving, this aluminum disc will move. So when the aluminum disc is rotating, so in the edges, we provide one damping magnet. So this damping magnet or the bar magnet, what this will do because the flux will move from the North Pole to South Pole. When this disc is rotating, this flux will link with this disc. So EMF is induced in this disc. So that leads to the eddy currents inside the disc. So that eddy currents will oppose the motion. So that eddy current will produce a torque which will oppose the cause. What is the cause? 
rotation of the disc inside a magnet so it will produce a torque in the opposite direction to motion of the disc in that way the eddy current damping is provided this is one way so this is mainly used in the case where permanent magnets are not there so we keep the artificially keep the permanent magnets on the disc like this so second case whichever instrument there is a permanent magnet is already there having more strength so in that case what we will do this is my rotating part and this is my coil which is placed on the rotating part so this rotating part what we will do we will provide one metal former generally aluminium former is used so when this rotating part or the moving system is moving inside the permanent magnet so emf will be induced in this metal former non magnetic metal former so that will induce the circulating currents so our eddy currents which is called as eddy current that eddy currents will oppose the cause oppose the cause means the cause is rotation of the disc or the rotation of the rotating part so that will oppose it or produce the torque in the opposite direction again detail analysis of these two torques will be discussed in detail with the derivation and numericals in the coming lectures in detail so that's why i am proceeding further so next one is coming to the moving system so in order to reduce the loading effect of the instrument we have seen in the errors that the loading effect of the instrument should be minimum so this is discussed in chapter number 1 if you have doubt you can please refer there in module 1 i have discussed what is the loading effect of the instruments so the power consumed by the instrument should be as minimum as possible so that there will be no loading effect of the instrument on your system measuring system so this is possible by decreasing the weight of the moving parts and the friction of the moving part should be as minimum as possible so that loading effect will be minimum so minimum deflecting torque is required to produce the required deflection of the pointer so for that the weight should be minimum so in order to decrease the weight of the rotating parts so two types of supports are used in practice first one is called as the trout suspension so this is used in instrument of galvanometer type that means high accuracy type wherever you want the high sensitivity and low friction is required so only in costly and highly sensitive instruments only this type of suspension is used and for wherever you want that your rough and tough use of the instrument should be there like in the case of labs or normal laboratories where the students perform these instruments are not used because the problem is we cannot use it in a rough and tough because the construction will be like this there will be a spring will be used on top and bottom this is used for providing the required tension so that the moving element will remain in its position in this position only irrespective of which angle you are keeping the instrument and then there will be a suspension ribbon also will be there this ribbon serves two purpose one purpose is providing the supporting for this moving element and the second purpose is whenever the moving element is rotating we have to provide the controlling torque so this ribbon will provide the controlling torque also i am repeating once again this is used in instruments of galvanometer type which require low friction and high sensitivity and the ribbon suspension provides the required controlling torque in addition to supporting so in this case there is no rotating part jewel or bearings or nothing are there so friction will be minimum in this case so automatically sensitivity of the instrument will be maximum this is required where high accuracy and more sensitivity is there and rough and tough handling of the instrument is not required so wherever in the practical wherever you are using in your laboratory or others we always go for this type of support that is pivot and jewel bearings are used so in this case the moving system is mounted on a spindle that spindle is made up of the hardened steel and the two ends of the spindle are made conical you can see here that the ends of the spindle that is on the other side as well as on this side so it is made up of in the form of a conical and then polished to form the pivots so this is called as pivot getting it so the tips of this pivot are rounded in the bottom because the purpose of rounding is if they are very narrow then contact area will be minimum so friction will be minimum but the pointer is one this is very narrow so entire weight of your entire system is falling on a small tip that may lead to spoiling of the tip so that's why generally with the tips are little bit polished and they are rounded to form a hemispherical surface but of very small area as small as possible so that it can withstand the required weight at the same time it will not give the more frictional force there is a compromise between these two things so it is placed in the jewel so the jewel is ground to the cone because it is also just we are make the grinding in the form of a cone only but this cone will have the more angle when compared to this pivot so that the contact area will be minimum so generally this jewels are made up of shaft iron practice so this will be the practical construction of this entire bearing setup so it will be like this this is my pivot 
so this pivot is kept on the jewel so this jewel is connected through the spring to your remaining system so the purpose of this spring is to avoid damage due to shocks so whenever your instrument is viewed or some shock comes on this instrument because i told you that this tip is very narrow whenever you are shaking your instrument or when you are moving the instrument there is a chance that force will fall on this tip and this this may damage this pivot may damage in order to avoid that problem what we will do the required damping is provided by the spring here this is to provide the avoid the damage due to shocks so these are the basic things that are required to proceed further so next class we are going to see what are the different types of control torques or control forces that are used that is spring control and the next type of control is gravity control so after that we will proceed for one by one topic i hope this entire topic is completely clear to you if you still have any doubts you can leave your comments in the comment section below i will answer to your queries from there thank you thank you very much